From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. We begin in Mexico, where a group of about 100 migrants has been deported from Tijuana and are heading back to Honduras. The migrants have reportedly given up their asylum request in the United States and now are on their way to their home country by plane. The Mexican Commissioner of National Migration Institute claims that the migrants are leaving voluntarily. Mexico's government says it will deport 500 migrants who try to cross out to cross onto U.S. soil as U.S. border troops fire tear gas at them on Saturday. The President of the United States is angry right now. If he dies of a heart attack, we will pay for it. That is why I'm leaving. I don't want to be an accomplice to that death. I left a five-year-old boy in Honduras, and I'll be happy because I'll see him, hug him, and never separate from him. And the second migrant caravan has now arrived in Tijuana. 500 migrants have arrived at a shelter in the border city to join the 5,000 plus migrants already there in their hope of crossing into the U.S. after a journey of 180 kilometers from Mexicali. These migrants, most of them Honduras, will, will be sheltered in a local sports center a few meters away from the border wall. We belong to the second caravan. There's a lot of people in this one. We came here because there is no work back home. We need to figure out what to do when it comes to food. It seems it's difficult. There are a lot of people and sometimes there isn't enough food. And sometimes people are left without it. Our correspondent in Mexico, Alina Duarte, has more on this. Hello, we are here in Tijuana, Mexico, where around 6,000 migrants have arrived to this shelter. Around 200 have been deported after trying to cross the U.S. border last Sunday, and dozens of them have decided to go back to their countries they asked to be self-deported. Yesterday at the press conference, the migrants requested a number of things, including that the U.S. speed up the process to seek asylum, that the incoming Mexican government create a commission willing to negotiate with the migrants who wish to stay, and to stop the arbitrary, manipulate, and involuntary deportations. Additionally, they pleaded for solid information that could help uh, to make better decisions and protect their lives. And Mexico's incoming foreign minister has said uh, only a project the size of post-World War II reconstruction efforts could address the flow of migrants heading towards the United States. Marcelo Ebrard is due to meet U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Sunday. He says the poor migrants is not a solution to this crisis. He believes that conditions that are causing them to flee their home countries must be addressed. To regulate migration flows, first, there must be opportunities for migrants. We must promote development in their countries and respect people's rights. That's the objective of what we're promoting. With the United States, I will go with the general idea. But it's the same theory. We're trying to convince them to take part in our idea. And members of the migrant caravan have made a series of demands to the Mexican and U.S. governments. We request of President Donald Trump to accelerate the process of asylum in the United States because everyone has the right to ask for political asylum, as my colleagues said, that a commission is formed by the new government of Mexico that comes to negotiate a presidential solution for those who want to stay here. Today is when countries are needed to come to the rescue of all the migrants. We are suffering. We are not suffering because we want to. We need to bring our families forward. And what happened on Sunday was a peaceful march. Many people have their families back in Honduras, starving and went out to work to feed them. More than 2,300 migrant children and teenagers are living in the Tornillo Emergency Detention Camp in Texas. The camp was opened last June by the U.S. government. It has capacity for 360 minors and is a temporary shelter. Currently, there are more than 2,000 young migrants detained there, waiting to be re reunited with their families. 
They range in age from 13 to 17, and most have come from Central America. Now we say! Now we say! And also in Mexico, indigenous people displaced from their lands have suspended dialogue with the government of Chiapas following attacks by police. The authorities used tear gas to evict close to 400 indigenous people from a main square in the state of Chiapas last Sunday. The march began on November 19th with the, with the goal of talking to the governor about the displacement they face in their territories. The group is now deciding whether to remain in Chiapas or to continue to march towards Mexico City. In Colombia, where a student has been arrested during a national, nationwide strike against tax reform and high unemployment, Daniel Morales, a graphic design student, was hanging a banner over a bridge. The banner was intended to bring attention to unemployment and the demands of the demonstrators. Ivan Duque's administration is bracing, is bracing for nationwide strikes. Workers, pensioners, campesinos, indigenous people and university students will state joint protest action in each of the regional capitals. Our correspondent Tatiana Portela in Bogota, Colombia tells us more. We're here in downtown Bogota where teachers, pensioners, workers, union representatives and members of the LGBTI community are all preparing to head out to Bolivar Square for a massive demonstration. Students taking part in a national strike from all around the country will also join in on the action. They're demanding answers from the government about its failure to adequately fund public universities. Protesters are also standing in solidarity against Colombia's financial law. Unions fear these regulations will have an adverse effect on the country's poor. Over the last two weeks, hundreds of university students have walked from all parts of the country to take part in this national strike. Thank you, Tatiana, for that report. Also in Colombia, a debate over the Attorney General ended near midnight Tuesday with the official refusing to step down. According to the opposition, recently published audio recordings of the late businessman Jorge Pisano and the prosecutor Nestor Humberto Martinez are proof of a conflict of interest. They say he must resign. The prosecutor defended himself by presenting other audio recordings. The prosecutor also went after Senator Gustavo Preto and accused him of being part of a conspiracy. Uribe aligned lawmakers published a video showing Senator Petro receiving money and denied Petro the ability to respond to the, to the debate, which will resume on Wednesday. The People's Summit has kicked off in Argentina with various social groups and political movements coming together in Buenos Aires. The summit aims to discuss an alternative agenda to the G20 summit. This will be done through lecturers and workshops on many topics, including capitalism, LGBTQ rights, and feminism, among others. The world organizers are also planning to protest in front of the country's Congress on Thursday, a day before the, G the G20 summit begins in earnest. Our correspondent Sabrina Roth is in Buenos Aires and tells us more. The G20 summit has attracted large-scale protests around the world. This Friday and Saturday, world leaders will meet in the city of Buenos Aires. On Tuesday, we witnessed the first massive rally organized by social and political movements. They're strongly criticizing IMF-imposed policies. Meanwhile, the People's Summit will take place in front of Congress. A number of meetings will also take place over the next few days while the summit is in session. These include forums led by the Continental ALBA movement, the World Lawyers Network for Food Sovereignty, and the Continental Union. Having arrived in Argentina for the G20 summit, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman could find himself embroiled in legal problems. Following the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, Prince Mohammed had hoped to rebuild, rebuild his reputation at the summit in Buenos Aires. But now a prosecutor in the Latin American country has agreed to take up a case against Bin Salman for possible war crimes committed in Yemen, where the humanitarian situation is worsening. Some countries are now calling on the Saudi coalition to end its military campaign in the Republic. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this.
Welcome back. Vice President Maria Alejandra Vicuña, in Ecuador, Vice President Maria Alejandra Vicuña has been accused of soliciting financial contributions during her term as Congresswoman. Our correspondent Denise Herrera in Quito tells us more. Hello, good afternoon. The Vice President of Ecuador, Maria Alejandra Vicuña, has been accused of making illegal contributions to her assistance for her political movement. She was accused by one of her former advisors, Angel Zagbay, who said that when she was lawmaker in the National Assembly, she took bribes from people who wanted to take particular posts. She said yesterday in a press conference at the palace government that I have nothing to hide and will never participate in actions that are not attached to ethics, which is indeed the flight I have raised throughout my life and the characteristic of my actions both public and private. She told the media and rejected these accusations and also said that she will start an investigation to prove her innocence. Also, the Attorney General of Ecuador, Ruth Palacio, said that her office will open an investigation under these allegations. Also today, her, the Secretary of Communication, Andres Mil. Chilena talked to the media and said that the message of the of the president Lenin Moreno is clear and is the justice the institution that will prove her innocence or will prove the responsibles of these actions. Is all the information we'll have for now back to you at the studios. The Ecuadorian Ombudsman's office has spoken about the situation of former Vice President Jorge Glass. In life of Glass Health, they have urged the judiciary through Twitter to decide on its position with re regard to the medical attention for him. Brazilian President elect Jair Bolsonaro has named an, a former army officer as the country's infrastructure minister. Tarciso Gomes de Freitas is a civil engineer who was trained in the Military Engineering Institute. On Monday, Bolsonaro named an, ar an army general as government secretary and military personnel were also given minister posts in defense, institutional security and science ministries. President-elect said he expects to announce the rest of his cabinet next this week. Brazil's Supreme F Federal Court will analyze an appeal presented by the defense of former President Lula da Silva in December. Lula's lawyers presented this appeal to ask for the invalidation of the process and the freedom of former president. They say this is due to the loss of impartiality of former judge Sergio Moro, who sent Lula to prison and is now Bolsonaro's justice minister. Lula da Silva has been sentenced to 12 year imprisonment. He's been in jail since April of this year. Brazil's government has pulled out from the hosting the 2019 United Nations Climate Conference, citing budgetary constraints and the transition to Jair Bolsonaro's administration. Questions now arise over the conference's venue as Latin America and the Caribbean are supposed to host it. Critics say the withdrawal is a troubling confirmation of the president-elect interest in climate change and environmental issues. Members of the Brazilian Socialist Party are speaking out against the incoming government of Jair Bolsonaro and his recent comments against the Cuban doctors who were working in the country. Members of the PSB in the country's lower house have made President-elect Jair Bolsonaro responsible for what is sure to be a tragedy for Brazilians once all Cuban doctors have left the country. The lack of doctors in Brazil is now the responsibility of the president-elect. He's at fault for the Cuban doctors leaving. He is responsible for the thousands who will be left with no access to medical attention. In a letter supporting the Cuban government's decision to pull out these doctors, members of the PSB also lamented the various positions of the incoming government. The Cuban government made the right choice. These people came to help Brazil. They helped those less fortunate, those in rural areas. And then they were humiliated and attacked during Bolsonaro's campaign. The response by the Cuban government shows they will defend their dignity. Over 28 million Brazilians were cared for by the Cuban doctors, who worked in the most vulnerable areas of the country, regions with low rates of human development. 
The Cuban doctors took care of people. They felt people's pain and tried to find ways of resolving it. Brazilians felt this and valued the doctor's care. Brazilian doctors are often more concerned with money and their own living conditions, because medicine is a field for those with money. Out of the 16,000 health experts who formed part of the More Doctors program, over 8,000 were Cuban. Brazilian Catholic priest Pedrinho Guareschi has said that the jailing of former President Lula da Silva and attempts to criminalize social movements in the country are part of a scheme by the current regime to, inst to instill fear in the, po in the population. The priests who visit Lula in jail on Monday say during, during the visit they discuss about the injustice and oppression that PT members and minorities communities are going through in Brazil. Representatives from various sectors of Bolivia are carrying out a march in support of the candidacy of Evo Morales, who will, re, who will run for re-election alongside Vice President Alvaro Garcia Linera in the 2019 presidential election. Bolivia's Central Workers' Union and in La Paz. In a tweet, Morales congratulated all candidates who are enrolling in the election race. Public workers in Chile will continue to protest because they failed to reach an agreement with the government. Public workers were unable to settle on a new salary as both the finance and labor ministers were absent from Tuesday's meeting. President of the Central Workers Union said that they couldn't advance the discussion with the government and are left with no choice but to continue with their demonstrations. Public workers are demanded a salary increase of 3.5%. The government has not progressed on the matter, so public workers' movement will continue to mobilize to keep putting pressure on them. We hope we can reach an agreement, and if we cannot reach that agreement, it will be the government's responsibility, because it has not been able to articulate specific proposals. Paola Dragnik, our correspondent in Santiago, Chile, tells us more. There have been three days of national strike as public workers are trying to negotiate their wages for 2019. As of yet, there are no answers emerging from labor's unions meeting with the government. Workers are demonstrating and the Chilean government has responded with the use of water cannons on the protesters as they wait for information about their salaries in Constitution Square. Thank you, Paula, for that report. License of Argentinian petrol company y, uh, YPF have been suspended by Necuden province after a fuel spill happened in Chile. Seven, 700,000 liters of fuel were spilled, by last 16, were spilled last 16 October in the south of Chile. Environmental, social and human organizations presented a report before ministry against the company for environmental damages. The place of the spill is a great geolog geological formation that could have one of the most important hydrocarbons reserves in the world. Peru's public prosecutor has issued a prohibiting order which will prevent the husband of opposition leader Keiko Fujimori from leaving the country. This means that Mark Vito, who's facing money laundering charges himself, isn't allowed to travel out of Peru for three years. His attorneys, however, are set to appeal the decision. Just 90 kilometers from the Nicaraguan capital, the Healthy Yard program is strengthening food security in the city of Baoco. Known as the two-story city, Boaco has over 50,000 inhabitants. Farming and raising livestock are the main economic activities that support hundreds of families. The Healthy Yard program aims to allow people to grow their own food from their own homes. More and more people in the region are reaping the benefits, with over 8,000 healthy yards and having been delivered so far. The aim is to ensure the production of healthy food for families in places where there isn't much space, in a context of urban agriculture. The development of Capacities and Technological Adoption Center is responsible for this program. And it's not just delivering plants to participating families. They are also providing the necessary training to the beneficiaries 
who are working their own land. We start by using containers for recycling. We also teach the participants to make organic fertilizer. Additionally, we have warm composting, which we mix with soil to make the substrate that allows the seeds to germinate. Everyone learns using what they have to hand. We explain the theory, and they put it into practice. Nimia, who created her own healthy yard four years ago, says that she received a package of plants, including vegetables and fruits, as well as medicinal and aromatic herbs. Before, we weren't sewing, and now we are. We have coffee, cocoa, bananas, we work, sell, and eat from it. And that benefits everyone in my home. According to the Ministry of Family Economy, there are 270, 367 diverse healthy yards nationally, of which 40 percent sell their surplus in local markets. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back. A former rebel leader in the Democratic Republic of Congo, accused of mass rape and crimes against humanity, has gone on, has gone on trial in a military court. Tabo Sheko and his rebels are accused of raping more than 300 women in 2010 in the country's mineral-rich but violated eastern region. Sheko, who founded the Nduma Defense of Congo Militia in 2019, is also accused of theft and looting as well as recruiting children into his militia. Now let's take a look at some other stories making headlines from around the world. Negotiators from Iran, Turkey and Russia have met with Syrian officials in Kazakhstan capital Astana for talks about preserving a 10-week-old Idlib truce in Syria. Made in September 2018, the truce is under threat after an alleged chemical attack in the Syrian city of Aleppo over the weekend. Aside from this, negotiators are also discussing conditions for the return of millions of refugees who have been displaced during Syria's seven-year civil war. About 7,000 Greek private sector workers have taken to the streets in Athens to call on the government to put an end on austerity policies. They demanded to restore minimum wage and pension to the rate before Greek financial crisis in 2010. The 24-hour strike has caused traffic jams and disrupted public transportation in the Greek capital. Many train and island ferry services were suspended across the country as well. The private sector is striking today, throughout Greece. We are demanding the complete exit from the bailout policies which have plagued Greece's society and economy over the past 10 years. Shifting gears now. Israeli archaeologists have presented to the public more than 9,000-year-old stone mask in Jerusalem. Authorities claim the mask was unearthed in a village in the West Bank several months ago, but they remain vague about the exact circumstances. The rare artifact was carved from limestone and is said to come from the Neolithic period and was used in ancestral worship rituals. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping have met in Madrid. The Chinese president is on an official three-day visit to Spain with a view towards strengthening economic and diplomatic ties. Xi Jinping will also visit Portugal before arriving in Argentina for the G20's meeting. We end in Lebanon when climate change is threatening Lebanon's symbolic cedar trees. As temperatures rise and rain and snowfall decreases, tiny insects are eating away at the tree's pine needles. To address this environmental concern, the government has launched a program to replant 40 million trees. And we come to the end of this news brief. This and many other stories you can find it at our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.